afternoon, everyone. I have missed seeing you in the museum for our lecture series. And Nancy Shepard, our guest today for our Hampton Roads history lecture, was scheduled to appear back in April, and then we all know what happened. Um, so she is now with us today, virtually. Um, happy, happy that she can do this, and she's going to share one of the more fascinating aerial stories that I know from since I moved to Hampton Roads, um, the airship Roma. And Tim today is in our new TV studio at the museum with an 85 inch television screen that is playing video of the Roma and et cetera behind him. So we're excited to have that new equipment and Tim to operate it for us. Now just a few words about Nancy Shepard. Nancy is a Hampton Roads native. She has an affinity for everything maritime, including octopi, which is on her sh shirt. Um, she is also um, a descendant of Robert Worden, our favorite man at the USS Monitor Center, one of them. She is a daughter of an active or retired US Navy personnel, and her husband is active duty. She's a mother of two, a busy girl. She is always researching something of local interest or historical or maritime interest. She holds a BA in history from American Military University. She has published thus far four books. Her latest just came out a couple of weeks ago and is titled Abandoned Tidewater, Forgotten Relics of Southeastern Virginia. And you'll see her off on her press tour here locally doing a lot of appearances with her new book. But we are really interested in the Roma today and how it ties in to Hampton Roads history and maritime history. Nancy is not only an author and researcher, she lectures often, and she's an advocate for military families with special needs and is very big on the awareness to let people know about autism spectrum disorders. We appreciate that platform that you cover for that, Nancy. And it's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Nancy E. Shepard. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Julie and Tim, and thank you for that warm introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen with everyone, so that way you can see lots of pictures. Now, what you see behind me is actually Roma. Um, it's the inside of her, but we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you. All right, and then let me make, make that gray box you all are seeing disappear. All right. So as Julie and Tim said, my name is Nancy E. Shepard, and I am a nonfiction author and historian based right here in Hampton Roads. I would like to thank the Mariners Museum and Park for having me out for this virtual presentation and for all of you for sharing your afternoon and your lunchtime with me. Um, so it is today that we're going to talk about a kind of a forgotten piece of local history, aviation history, military history, and frankly, world history. And that is the tragedy of the US Army dirigible Roma. Now, this is a story that was meant to be steeped in legend. Uh, it was meant to honor undeniable heroes and one that is filled with strife and struggle, triumph, love, lost, and failure. It is also all the things that make for an epic tale or that you find inscribed upon memorials or with streets named after them. But this, which was the single deadliest disaster of an American hydrogen airship, has been mostly buried and forgotten in the near century since 34 men lost their lives in the line of duty on that dark day in 1922. So today we will bring them back to life. We will hear their voices, so to say. We we're, we will celebrate their lives together. We're gonna grieve their sacrifices and we're gonna honor these brave men whose memories have been buried alongside their bodies. Okay. Okay, excuse me, I am flipping through my notes here. So the time following World War I was one of brilliant change for technology and frankly for society. 
Now, relief swept the United States after the Treaty of Paris was signed. And during this, there were a lot of changes, including stripping the Rhineland of its military might, including their aviation technology, which was a little bit more advanced than our own. Uh, one of the overarching innovations that came from the war was, again, the brilliant military use of air power. Now, what you're seeing right now on your screen is actually a um, newsreel that was played in uh, movie theaters at the time. Now, planes, which are also called heavier than air, were fragile, but they were fast. Uh, the truth was they weren't that practical. They couldn't carry really any cargo with them. Uh, they could maybe carry one or two people. And at one point during World War I, the shelf life of a pilot was only two weeks. It was a race between which technology would prevail, and many argued it would be the airships or lighter than air. There were several different types of airships. So to give you a brief familiarization for terminology here, we have the rigets, which were these gigantic airships could be over a thousand feet long. What you think of when you think of like Hindenburg or Graf Zeppelin, they were massive and they had a rigid framework inside the actual gas bag itself. And the advantage with these is that they could carry great numbers of cargo, people, perform operations and stay a lot, a lot longer. Then we have the blimps, which, are, which is the airship you see in here. And when the gentleman that's in this footage, we will talk about in a second. And these could only carry a handful of people, but they were wonderful for espionage purposes. And lastly, and this is the one we're gonna concern ourselves with today, was the love child of these two technologies, which is the semi-rigid dirigible. Now these could carry a substantial number of people or cargo. They were a bit more steady and predictable than their rigid counterparts. And so they were seen to be by some a practical option. Now, Billy Mitchell, who was father of the modern U.S. Air Force, was an advocate for growing the aviation branch. And in particular, he was also an advocate for airships. Uh, newsreels like what we just saw uh, were played in local theaters, enticing young men to join the aviation branch of the military. Now, the Navy was then charged with building a, or procuring a large rigid dirigible. Billy Mitchell wanted one of his own, not to be outdone by the Navy. And when the Navy passed on procuring a second-hand Italian airship, which was a semi-rigid, in late 1920, Billy Mitchell and Major Van Nostrand, who was the director of the Lighter Than Air program for the U.S. Army, wanted this airship for themselves. After a minor debate, it was agreed that a crew of the best and brightest that the military, the Army, had to offer would go to Italy to inspect the ship and bring her home to the new Lighter Than Air, Avi Lighter Than Air Aviation School at Langley Field right here on the peninsula in Hampton. Now, one of the first chosen was Captain Dale Mabry, who you just saw in this newsreel. Um, he was the gentleman that, um, let's see if I rewind it a little bit, is right, if you can see my mouse, that my mouse is pointing to right there. He was a native of Tampa, a consummate bachelor, and an evangelist for lighter than air technology. And he would serve as the second in command or the executive officer. Major John Gray Thornell, oh, got a hit there, with this most unfortunate mustache, was a former infantry officer who finished near the bottom of his class at West Point. But he was chosen as the ship's commanding officer. Now, he may have not been cut from the cloth of an infantryman, but he was definitely a lighter than airman. He was pulled from commanding a new base in Texas in order to command Roma, as this was set to be the biggest in the military's fleet in general, because the Navy hadn't yet gotten a large airship. The third in command was Lieutenant Walter J. Reed, who I am pointing my mouse to right now. And he was a graduate of Columbia University with a degree in architecture. He was a brilliant and humbled man, and humble man, and he was discharged from the military following World War I. However, his best friend, Captain Dale Mabry, called him and asked him to, to rejoin and accompany them on this exciting time for history. And there is Captain Mabry right there. So of course, uh, Lieutenant Reed called his girlfriend, Maria Blackiston, who was from Hampton, and said, hey, 
I've been called to go to Italy and I think that would make a really great honeymoon. Why don't we get married? And she readily agreed. Now this picture is from their wedding day, which was taken just before leaving to Genoa en route to Italy in, in February, 1921. Now, there are several other people that were chosen for this particular task. And again, they wanted the best and brightest they had to offer. So to name them, it was a five-man crew comprised of, this is Master Sergeant Roger McNally. This is Master Sergeant Harry Ch Chapman. This is Sergeant Joseph Biedenbach, who was the only one of these men not to serve during World War I. Sergeant Marion Jethro Bell and then Sergeant Virgil Hoffman. Sorry about that. Now, before leaving for Italy, Sergeant Virgil Hoffman, who's him right there, returned to Langley Field from his native Eaton Rapids, Michigan. Like many men, he was discharged following the war. He came from a large railroading family and he tried to take part of that, but he longed for more than the rails and the steam that his family knew. He longed to be back in Hampton with his girlfriend that he had fallen in love with, the Phoebus native Stella Hoover. He was madly in love with her. During the time between when he left the military and when he came back, uh, his family said that he would spend days just reading her letters over and over again. So he asked her to marry him and they purchased a piece of property in Hampton for them to build a home together and they agreed that they would get married sometime in the summer of 1922. Now let's talk about the trip over to Genoa. It was a rather harrowing one. The ship that they were on uh, was filled with a group of graveyards atten attendants and funeral directors, and they were being all ferried across the Atlantic during a time when they were encounter encountering violent storms. At one point, Walt Reed turned to his new bride, Maria, and told her that if anything should happen, she should climb in an empty coffin to sail away to safety. However, they arrived in Genoa with only nerves rattled and ready to board a train to go to Rome. As per the instructions given by the Italian crown, the Italians were to select the date of this inspection flight for Roma and the Americans were only allowed to do one inspection flight. Now they were enthusiastic with the prospect and the terms were readily agreed upon. So on March 15th, 1921, the eight officers and crewmen, Maria Reed and Major Thornell's wife, Marie, made their way to the field just outside of Rome. They were greeted there by dignitaries like Ambassador Robert Underwood Johnson, who I'm, I'm appointing to right now. Uh, some of the ship's designers, including the famed Umberto Nobile, right here. Elite members of society like Prince Vigo of Denmark, and he was decked out in his flamboyant dress uniform, followed by an entourage, and then reporters from all over Italy and the United States, including acclaimed writer Kenneth Roberts. With the sun bright overhead and a warm breeze caressing the hillside, the giant barn doors of the hangar opened and out was pulled the giant silvery machine with black letters painted on to her side, clearly stating her name, Roma. She was unlike anything the Americans saw before. She was, had a rigid keel structure, so this had like a skeletal framework here, with a dura aluminum cupola on her nose cap, which is right in here. She had 11 mini balloon compartments called ballonets throughout the inside of her gas bag. And she had six 12 cylinder Ansaldo engines, which ran parallel in, on either side of the ship and at different angles to avoid a slipstream effect. But perhaps the most jarring and strange piece of Roma of, was her giant rudder, which you see back here, which, oops, there's my mouse, which was shaped like a box kite. Um, kind of like the wings, I guess you could say, of a triplane. And it was allegedly made that way for ease of maneuverability. With the sky overhead, the sun bright, and people boarding the ship, it was decided today would be a great day to fly. The airship lifted off the ground with ease as people filtered it through the passenger cabin, the walkways to the engines, and the bridge. The Italian captain merrily often let 
left the wheel unattended, allowing anyone who wanted to steer the ship to do so. The ripple of air travel proved queasy to stomachs unfamiliar with what it was like to fly, which of course was a massive novelty in 1921 and very uncommon. Now, despite all of this, the inspection flight, allegedly inspe inspection flight, was, I would say, more of a spectacle. Elaborate three-course meals were served on tablecloths with crisp linens. Uh, wine bottles, wine flowed freely amongst the guests. And keep in mind, during this time, we were in prohibition in the United States, with some people going out to the walkways to the engines and just chucking them off the side of the ship. At one point, one of the American officers commented how he missed his after-meal cigar. Then one of the designers reminded him that the ship was inflated with the very flammable gas hydrogen. The American officer brushed him off, stating that, and to paraphrase, one could light a bonfire in the center of the ship and nothing would happen to her. There was so much fantastical partying that no one even noticed when Roma couldn't gain the lift she needed to go over the caldera of Mount Vesuvius, but instead just went around to the volcano side. Kenneth Roberts, who is this joyful looking man right there, described this as having a prisoner of Zenda feel. The American crew took just a very little time to familiarize themselves with the Italian built on Saldo engines. These were ones they had never dealt with before, and Sergeant Bell noted that they seemed to run oily. When Roma after, landed after sunset that day, the Americans stumbled, stumbled off, some trying to regain, gain their land legs, while some were slightly intoxicated due, due to the wine that flowed free. And Major Thornell went to go right to his superiors. He said, and I quote, I am most impressed with a semi-rigid type of airship and believe it has great possibilities. Without question, the Americans wanted to bring Roma home. However, there were concerns over her condition. Roma was built in 1919, originally designed to be used during World War I, but when the war came to an end before her construction was completed, they had to refit her as a transportation vessel. In fact, there were ambitions to run passenger lines between Rome and Rio de Janeiro, and this was a dream that never came to fruition. Instead, she served as kind of a sightseeing vehicle, flying over top the Italian capital, sometimes carrying King Victor Emmanuel. The bag was made from this thin silk and cotton blend, and it was a material that can only be made in Italy. The lifespan of this bag was coming to an end and Major Thornell advocated for a new one. Major Van Nostren, that we mentioned earlier, and Secretary Weeks, who was the Secretary of War, told Thornell that her bag was fine, they would procure one at a later date. He then advocated to fly her back. After all, the Italians were planning to use her for transatlantic passage, but Major Van Nostren ordered him to instead disassemble Roma and pack her into cargo crates to which Thornell reluctantly agreed. A contract was signed, and this is a page of it, between the Americans and the Italians to purchase Roma. While the Italians originally asked for $475,000, they readily agreed to a negotiated sale price of $184,000. As being in the future, we had the foresight to think, huh, maybe that should have told them something. Now, while Roma was being packed up, there were other issues coming to light regarding the dangers of hydrogen. Hydrogen had a lot of advantages. It was cheap to process and it was an extreme, it's an extremely light gas. However, the trade-off is that hydrogen is highly flammable in the right conditions. There were murmurings of switching to helium, but the natural naturally procured gas was expensive and the lift value was noticeably less than hydrogen. Therefore, hydrogen was the commonly used lifting gas at the time. The U.S. Navy was in the midst of procuring a British-built rigid ship while Roma was also being purchased. In 1921, a group of U.S. naval aviators went to England to do a test flight aboard the R-38 that you see here which was slated to be renamed the ZR-2 once placed under the American colors. Along with this was this naval crew was public affairs officer Lieutenant Clifford A. Tinker with a background that included aeronautics, 
it was his job to inform both the Americans and the British of news regarding R-38. On August 24th, 1921, the ship lost structural integrity over the Humber River in, in England. When oxygen mixed with the already unstable hydrogen gas inside, the ship exploded, killing all but five of the 49 men on board. Lieutenant Clifford Tinker accompanied the bodies of his naval brethren home. Traumatized after seeing firsthand the dangers of this gas, he swore that he would do all in his power to ensure that no other American would lose their life on an airship because of hydrogen. In the meantime, Rama was shipped to Langley Field and to be reassembled. Now, Langley Field was a fairly new base sitting along the river up here in Hampton Roads Peninsula and just short distance from the Naval Station across the water and the Armory Quartermaster Depot in Norfolk. Langley housed the heavier than air squadrons or the planes, the photography school, the lighter than air balloon school, and the base had its own hydrogen processing plant that you see here. They had casks of hydrogen stacked high into the sky surrounding the building and nearby stood an incredible hangar tailor-made to Roma's dimensions. Now Stella Hoover, fiance to Virgil Hoffman, waited for him to come home from Italy and to listen to all of his adventures as they walked in the sands on the beaches near her home in Phoebus. With Roma successfully purchased, now she needed a larger crew. Several others considered the best and brightest the Army LTA division had to offer came on board. This included Lieutenant Byron T. Burt Jr. Now he is pictured here with Captain Dale Mabry and he arrived to be the navigational officer. Now I'm not always certain if he was a lucky or unlucky man to have on board as he had survived three other airship accidents. Nonetheless, he was an extraordinarily decorated officer and he had an unparalleled understanding of the engineering of airships. Then there was Corporal Alberto Duke Flores, pictured here with uh, Corporal Irby Hevron and Sergeant Thomas Yarborough. And he was a native of Puerto Rico and he had perhaps the most terrifying job of anyone on this ship. He was tasked to be in the crow's nest, which was on the very tip top, if you imagine this being the front, it was right here. It was his job to monitor the tension and any slack in the bag he knew meant could be, could be certain death because that meant the ship was starting to collapse. Roma arrived at Langley Field the same month that ZR2 crashed on the other side of the Atlantic. The public was enraged by this tragedy in England, and, but the, the army, particularly Major Van Nostren, tried to deflect attention away from that disaster and towards the new grand aircraft that arrived in Virginia. Roma was billed in newspapers with words of grandeur, describing her as the American Eagle of the fleet. But what the public didn't know is what the crew found upon opening those pine box she was shipped in. As you know, if you've been to our part of the world, uh, summer in tidewater can be rather unforgiving between the humidity and unrelenting heat. When Master Sergeant Harry Chapman pulled Roma from her crate, he examined the gas bag. The thin silk fabric was covered in mildew and was deteriorated in tatters. He described the film as resembling lukewarm beeswax. Major Thornell once again went to Major Van Nostren and demanded they procure a new bag. Major Van Nostren insisted that the military did not have the funding for just such an expense and they would just have to patch her up the best they could. Recon the reconstruction supervised by Lieutenant Walter Reed was complex. The blueprints had to be deciphered from their original Italian and her foreign structure was a challenge for the crew to understand. She was refitted with a, a two-way radio system and an onboard photography studio. But the most difficult part of this entire process was maintaining gas inside her airbag. And what I mean by this is hydrogen purity, meaning a certain amount of hydrogen versus oxygen to keep it safe. 
Master Sergeant Chapman carefully monitored the hydrogen purity within Roma, but was often met with disappointment. Engineers like Jethro Bell and Virgil Hoffman trained on the oily Unsaldo engines, unfamiliar with their mechanics and their workings, and hesitant of their usefulness in the unpredictable climatic changes of the American Mid-Atlantic. Now, as summer turned into fall and leaves began to fall from the trees that year, pressure was put on Roma's crew to get her up and flying. She was constantly being touted in newspapers as the next grand thing. And after the disaster of ZR2, the War Department needed something promising to encourage public support of the Lighter Than Air program. By late October, Roma was finally able to maintain hydrogen purity in her gas bag at levels considered safe by the U.S. Army standards. It was time to get her in the air to fly. On the morning of November 15, 1921, what seemed like hundreds of people from all over the, the area in Virginia's Tidewater gathered at Langley Field to watch Roma. Stella Hoover stayed close to the girlfriends and wives of the other crew members, while Maria Reed regaled others with the tale of her flight in Italy earlier that year. The excitement on the ground was positively palpable. The barn doors of Langley's hangar opened and, the gr and her grounds crew pulled her from the hangar. There was a collective gasp as the sight of this oddly beautiful machine appeared before them. Newspaper reporters scrawled in their notebooks and cameras rolled from newsreels of this historic event. On board, the crew of Roma held their breaths as the grounds crew slowly let go of her tethers, as you see here. Master Sergeant Chapman carefully monitored the tubes indicating her hydrogen purity while Corporal Flores was up at the very tip of her nose to keep an eye on the, on the bag pressure. Jethro Bell and Virgil Hoffman took their positions at their engines and Captain Mabry, Lieutenant Reed, and Lieutenant Burke controlled the cables and wheels in the control cabin of the gondola. It was a flurry of well-managed movements about the ship as the keel steadily left the ground. After what seemed like an attorney, Lieutenant Burt indicated that they had reached their desired altitude. Major Thornell raced to the radio room to reach down to the ground below. He asked, how did we look? After a brief crackle and a pause, a voice radioed back, magnificent, and an incredible cheer rose from every rafter of the ship. It was now time to officially show her off. There we go. Around 11 o'clock, Sergeant Lee Harris heard a creak. Just as he looked out the out window of the ship, he watched a small aluminum door break free from the keel and forcefully smash one of the large propellers of an engine. The shattered pieces of the propeller tore into the gas bag. He knew he had mere minutes to save the ship and his crewmates. He grabbed two men along the way and they climbed into the gas bag and they patched the ballonet so no more oxygen could leak into the bag. They patched and they patched and patched until they were so overcome from breathing in the hydrogen that they passed out. They were remo removed soon thereafter as soon as possible from the gas bag and returned to the ship having saved the lives of their crew members. Upon returning to Langley Field that evening, the sergeant and his fellow uh, crewmates were shaken but unharmed. While the flight was hailed a success, many of the crewmen who witnessed the, this event had troubling feelings towards Roma. In fact, Master Sergeant Jethro Bell was, was a founding member of the tongue-in-cheek named group of crewmen called the Graveyards Club. They advocated getting transferred off the ship, but the army was unwilling to let them go. Jethro wrote to a friend, if it, Roma, was to come down, no one would be able to get clear of it. This ship is a death trap for sure. Lieutenant Clifford Tinker from the ZR2 resigned from the Navy and dedicated his life to making sure that no one else died on a U.S. ship because of hydrogen. He went to everyone who would listen, particularly Secretary Weeks of the War Department. 
in a means that was probably meant just to prove Tinker wrong or just quiet him, the Navy reluctantly agreed to test helium on, aboard a smaller, non-rigid ship and conduct trial flights between Naval Station Norfolk and Bowling Field in Washington, D.C. The data they retrieved from this flight was remarkable. Helium did not expand nor contract the way hydrogen did, and the ship was calculated to have zero gas loss. Despite helium being more expensive, this proved a long-term fiscal advantage. Popular journal of the day, Aerial Age Weekly said, summed up, it can be said that the use of helium as a gas for inhalation of airships has been demonstrated beyond a doubt. Now, despite the proof of efficacy of helium, the procurement plant for helium in Fort Worth, Texas was quietly closed in early December 1921. Horrified, Clifford Tinker went directly to Major Van Nostrum. He came up with a figure that would cost about $14,000 to transport helium needed for Roma from Fort Worth to Langley Field via railroad and maritime means. The plant in Fort Worth had double the amount of helium needed to fill Roma, but Major Van Nostrum insisted to Tinker that the Army simply didn't have the money to do so and that hydrogen would have to do. As for Roma, she needed to be officially placed in the American fleet, and an elaborate christening ceremony was scheduled in Bowling Field for later that same month. The winter of 1921 to 1922 was one met with an unusual chill for this part of the United States. The morning of December 21st, 1921 was indicative of this. Roma was scheduled to fly that day to Bowling Field for a ceremony to place her into the American fleet officially. In Washington, D.C., dignitaries from Italy and America gathered with Miss Finrose Wainwright, who would serve as the ship's sponsor. Everyone huddled together to keep warm as they watched the skies, waiting for Roma to arrive, but she was nowhere in sight. While waiting, Major Van Nostrand asked Clifford Tinker if he would like to take a ride on Roma someday. Without skipping a beat, Tinker replied, not until she is filled with helium. Major Van Oshen scoffed and insisted the of the ship's safety. Planes left the field searching for the forlorn dirigible. Several hours later, the vestige of the silvery airship broke through the gray clouds. But what was initially a cheer turned into silent horror as those on the ground watched her shimmying nearly out of control, as you can see here in this footage, from the clouds towards the ground. Her cables were dropped from the keel and the grounds crew ran struggling to pull this gigantic airship to the ground. It was then that it was noticed that the halyard that held the American flag to the back of, ship, of the ship had snapped and ironically, the American flag was flying upside down. Now, once it was safely on the field, Major Van or Major Thornell disembarked and advised Major Van Nostrand that they had arrived on only three of six engines working, with one having frozen in midair and being successfully restarted. The order was given to shorten the ceremony to allow Rama to return to Lake Langley for any necessary repairs. Midway through this abbreviated ceremony, the airship caught wind and rolled to her side, tearing more holes in her already fragile bag. More repairs were undertaken right there at Bowling Field in order to make her somewhat ser serviceable. With a skeleton crew on board, with the rest taking the rail home, Roma limped back to Langley Field that evening, landing that night on only one of six engines still working. Following the christening ceremony, Major Van Nostrin was called into a special committee before Congress regarding Roma. However, the transcript of this meeting wasn't initially released. The biggest public takeaway from it all was that it was time to switch out the oily Ansaldo engines with the lighter but more powerful Liberty V12 engines. An order was sent to McCook Field in Dayton, Ohio to begin refitting six of these engines for Roma. Back at Langley Field, Roma was temporarily grounded. 
Major Thornell received orders to report to Washington, D.C., and was given special permission to fly on Roma one last time. Captain Mabry was his natural successor for, for the commanding officer position, and Lieutenant Reed was promoted to the rank of captain and made the ship's executive officer. With the new year meant new engines. Charles Vorak, who you see here in this picture, led his team of civilian engineers from McCook to Langley Field to install the new engines and train the ship's, ship's crew on them. In the meantime, Captain Mabry put in yet another request to procure a new gas bag from Italy, citing its fragility. This time the War Department complied. However, this gas bag would take about six months to create let alone ship to Langley Field. Major Van Ostrin was unwilling to keep Roma in the hangar for that long. She needed to be flown, especially with new engines on board to check how well they would do. After removing the Ansaldos and installing the Liberties, a trial flight for, to test these engines was scheduled for February 21st, 1922. The evening before the trial flight, the officers, crew, and their sweethearts gathered at the officers club at Langley. There was music, dancing, cigars, camaraderie, and a rare moment of fraternization. Students from the, from the balloon school at the base were making a case to Captain Mabry as to why they should be chosen as observers on board the next day. Now, aside from the need for flight time to earn their wings, they were also able to receive extra pay for every flight. Virgil Hoffman and Stella Hoover whisked around the dance floor laughing and engrossed in each other as if they were the only two people that existed in the room. They occasionally popped outside and shared a smoke from Virgil's silver cigarette stash that he kept neat, neatly packed in his pocket. Captain William Kepner, a non-flying member of the crew, chatted up his fellow officers. These men were were ones that he served throughout the war with and considered more than just his fellow officers, but his brothers. Sergeant Jethro Bell spent time with other members of the Graveyards Club, some with more ominous feelings than others. Private Vernon Peake chatted with civilian engineer Ray Hurley, who was assigned to serve with him on the engine the next day. Notably missing was Captain Walter Reed, who was resting off a nasty flu. Maria tried to convince her husband to stay home the next day, in order to rest and recover, but he would hear nothing of it because if Roma was going up, so was he. A chill hung in the air that night and the merriment descended into a hush as Roma's men left the officer's club that evening. Many struggled to sleep that night and some with excitement and others had trepidations elapsing into fears. The morning of February 21st, 1922 was cold and dreary. The sky was overcast and the air hung heavy with a frosty drizzle. As everyone reported to Roma's hangar, Captain Mabry ordered them to get Roma ready, but was uncertain if the weather conditions would allow them to fly that day. Walter McNair, who was a physicist from the Bureau of Standards, arrived at the hangar with an instrument in hand in order to test the speed of Roma with her new engines. Around lunchtime, Captain Mabry temporarily discharged his crew in order to assess the elements of flight that day. Corporal Irby Hevron sat with his friend, Corporal Nathan Kuru, who was a non-flying member of the crew, and in a kind of tongue-in-cheek gallows humor comment, Hevron said to Kuru, if anything happens to me, you're taking me home. Before long, everyone started to report back to the hangar to hear what Captain Mabry decided to do and his decision was that they would fly that day. The flight wouldn't be a long one, just a circle around the greater Tidewater area and back to Langley, just long enough to test these new engines. There was a manic rush to get all 45 men on board. In fact, it was so quick that the ship's mascot dog was left behind with a non-flying member of the crew. Civilians from both Dayton and Langley and non-flying members of the crew acted as Roma's grounds crew that day. They heaved the behemoth from the hangar into the cold early afternoon. One of the grounds crew watched a, a triangular silvery patch flutter through the air and down to his feet. 
he paid it no mind, figuring it was purposefully done. Initially, the ship started lifting nose heavy. So if we were looking, thinking about that footage earlier for lifting at Langley Field, where she was going up very even, she was going up with this, the nose, and this, her stern. Captain Mabry ordered all of his crew to move everything and everyone as far astern as possible. Master Sergeant Chapman frantically adjusted the gas in each ballonet to account for the differentiation. There was just too much oxygen in the front. Captain Mabry insisted that they would reach horizontal equilibrium. After harrowing moments of what must have seemed like an eternity, the ship balanced and Captain Mabry let out a sigh of relief. Hopefully this would be the last of their troubles that day. As Roma powered away from Langley Field towards Hampton, Lieutenant Burt noticed that the ship felt like she was moving quicker than usual. Captain Reed also commented that the controls felt far more sensitive than he was used to with her. Walter McNair couldn't believe the readings on his instrument. She was moving approximately 75 miles per hour, approximately 25% faster than she had ever done before. When he commented on this to the others in control cabin, Major Thornell, who was observing that day, exclaimed, these liberties are the stuff. On the ground, people gathered outside to watch Roma fly over. When passing over Stella Hoover's home in Phoebus, Virgil Hoffman paused his work long enough to call down to his love, who watched quietly on the ground below. She had a pit in her stomach. Just a short distance away, Captain Mabry spotted the white lighthouse at Old Point Comfort, which was used as a way marker to let people know it was time to shift over to the other side of the water. At this point, Captain Reed became overcome with his symptoms from the flu and asked Lieutenant Burt to take over his position at the controls. Excuse me for a second, I apologize. Okay. Below Roma was nothing but the river and with the city of Norfolk dead ahead. Corporal Flores climbed into the crow's nest Cold drizzle and wind bombarded his face like knives. He carefully measured the gas bag, but she was 10 millimeters too loose. Problem with this meant that the structural integrity of the ship could collapse at any second. He needed to report this to the crew below. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Burt turned the control wheel and it spun freely in his hands without any response. He did it again just to make sure it wasn't a momentary fluke but it wasn't. He pulled the control cables for the rudder. They had no give. His eyes grew wide and he turned to Captain Mabry. She isn't responding. On the ground, men from the Naval Station gathered outside and watched as the airship seemed to be coming towards them instead of remaining aloft. In the backyard of a nearby neighborhood, a little boy was playing in his backyard while his mother hung the wash. He drew her attention to the airship and his mother clapped her hand over her mouth and whispered, those poor men. Corporal Flores attempted to climb down into the ship, but found his only passage pinched shut. There was no way he could notify his shipmates below. All he could do was sit there, watch the world pass around him and wait for whatever may have come. In the passenger cabin, the men knew that there was something wrong. Were they landing? What was happening? They had no clue what was going on in the ship and that the ship was not responding. Captain Mavery gripped the useless control wheel and gave the order to lighten the load. They needed to get to the Norfolk uh, Country Club to safely land the ship in the water. Men threw over anything they could get their hands on, tools, furniture, and anything that wasn't actually used to power the ship, but it didn't help. The engines were simply moving too fast to make a difference. The Norfolk Country Club was in sight, but they weren't going to make it at the speed they were going. They were heading towards the Army Quartermaster Depot. At the depot, a silent horror turned into rushed panic as the workers prepared for what may inevitably be. Roma seemed to be folding in on herself. Her rudder was no longer perfectly horizontal, but seemed to hang at a 45 degree angle. 
One civilian plant worker rushed towards the substation that powered the endless electrical wires throughout the depot, but the mud on the ground from that day's rain seemed to slow him down. Aboard Rama, the order was given to cut the engines. The center and rear engines received the message, but the forward engineers, for whatever reason, did not. Smokestacks rushed by them, each time Roma narrowly missing them. Corporal Flores gripped the fabric of the gas bag, hunched in position that would allow him to spring for his life if necessary. Captain Reed left the passenger cabin and returned to the control room to see how he could help while Lieutenant Burt memorized everything he saw around him. There was no longer an idea of saving the ship, but it was about saving themselves. In the passenger cabin, men huddled together, crying, praying, driven by madness over the sheer terror of what was unfolding around them. Lieutenant William Riley, a student observer, crawled towards an open door. His shipmates tried to warn him, we aren't high enough, your parachute won't open. But Lieutenant Riley seemed to not hear them and he jumped. The ground was nearing closer and closer. The electricity hadn't been shut off yet. Captain Mabry continued to grip the control wheel. And the last thing anyone heard before Roma's nose touched the ground was Captain Mabry's deafening call, my God, boys. Corporal Flores knew he had mere moments to save his life. When he saw the tip touch the ground, he leapt and he ran and ran and ran. And he couldn't tell if he was still in the air or on the ground until someone grabbed him. Lieutenant Burt was thrown through the window of the control cabin, sloshed by the mud. The men on the ground raced to pull, hit, pull out who they could, hoping that somehow the substation had been reached and the electricity to the wire shut off in time. Before they knew it, a magnificent explosion erupted from the ship, throwing everyone backwards. Flames and black smoke leapt into the air, the fire too hot to even let anyone near it. They watched the writhing of silhouettes of men letting out this ghastly scream and groans and one screaming, mercy, oh mercy. But there was nothing anyone could do as they watched these silhouettes disappear into this funeral pyre. Lieutenant Burt darted towards the fire and without thinking, he knew he needed to get his shipmates out. He was caught by an officer at the depot who wouldn't allow him to go anywhere near it. Burt protested to no avail. And after being turned away, he spotted a group of familiar faces, Ray Hurley, civilian engineer from the Cook Field and Private Vernon Peak. They were huddled around something. Burt raced over to them, initially relieved to see their faces, but relieved washed away to horror as he followed their gaze. There on the ground lay the mangled body of Lieutenant William Riley. His parachute never fully opened. Bert couldn't tell where and who had gotten from the ship in the flurry around him. He spotted Walter McNair walking solemnly behind a gurney, which carried an unrecognizable figure. McNair, Bert called. Who's that? Walter McNair turned to Bert with a stunned expression and replied, that's Master Sergeant Chapman. He dove back into the flames. He saved three men, including me. Men were taken to the post public health hospital for triage and care. Bert counted 11 in all, but where was everyone else? Were they taken somewhere else? Over in Phoebus, Stella Hoover could see a chimney of smoke from, the, from across the river. She had no idea what it was from, but her stomach fell with a sickly feeling. It couldn't be Virgil. He had told her that Roma was safe. He had to be safe. She was supposed to see him that evening. In Hampton, Maria Reed heard a knock on the door. She opened it to find Lieutenant William Kepner. Mrs. Reed, there's been an accident, he trailed off. Where's Walt, she asked. Kempner replied, I, I don't know. He took her to Langley where one of their fellow airmen flew her to Norfolk. She had to find her husband. It didn't take long for reporters to arrive on the scene. 
an intrepid, intrepid New York Times reporter wandered into where the men were recovering at the public health hospital. One survivor asked him, what of the other boys? The reporter gulped and informed them that from what he could tell, these 11 men were the only ones who were alive. An eerie silence painted the room until someone broke through with the exclamation, awful. At the quartermaster depot, it took hours to douse the flames. It was obvious that this was not going to be a rescue, but a recovery. Mr. Rouse from Rouse Funeral Home took the ferry from Newport News to Norfolk in order to collect the remains of Roma's victims. He called upon anyone he knew in the industry as his vehicle just simply would not be enough. Each body was woven from, unwoven from the dark aluminum wreckage. Anything that could be used to identify who they were was tagged and marked. A bracelet, coins, insignia pins, a silver cigarette case, anything. The last man pulled from the wreckage, which is pictured here. Let's see if I can get my mouse up right there. Still had his charred skeletal fingers tightly gripping the control wheel. Lieutenant Burt remained at the scene, a man who survived numerous airship accidents, served during the last horrors of World War I, stood shell-shocked. What happened? How could this happen? And why? Why were his shipmates, his brothers, gone? Maria Reed raced into the public health hospital, paying no attention to anyone who attempted to bar her from finding her husband. He couldn't be dead. He just, he couldn't. She scanned the faces until she spotted one all too familiar, and there was Walt. His hands and head were covered in gauze, and his uniform burned from his body. He sat next to Lieutenant Clarence Welch, both in silence. As the bodies arrived at Ralph's funeral home that evening, Captain William Kepner remained vigilant. It was his duty that night to help identify the remains. Also on hand was Dr. Jesse Mabry, a local dentist, and the older brother to Roma's commanding officer, he needed to find his little brother. The sight that beheld Captain Kempner was overwhelming. It was hard to distinguish if these were bodies or just charred pieces of debris. Some were simply browned while others were blackened with their heads, limbs, and other parts missing. It was a stench that was unbelievably heavy, but Captain Kempner had a duty to do but it was a sight he would never forget. He later stated that these were his brothers, his boon companions. Each man was identified and pieced back together throughout the night. News was telegraphed to Langley Field where anxious loved ones, including Stella Hoover, waited impatiently for any word of their loved ones. It seemed that there was more grief than relief. The last man to be identified, the man holding the control wheel was positively identified as Captain Dale Mabry. A hero to the end, he never left his post. Dr. Mabry removed his brother's wings from his tattered uniform and a few coins from his pocket. He quietly thanked Mr. Rouse and Captain Kemp Kepner and left. Several officers convened, were convened by the next morning to investigate what happened. Roma's surviving crew were barred from speaking to anyone during this investigation as a matter of confidentiality. Each man relayed their story as best they could. Vernon Peak recalled in moments following the crash, trying to pull a man from the wreckage, pulling so hard that the uniform buttons popped off the man's uniform. But there was nothing he could do. He was desperate to save his shipmate, but he couldn't and had to leave him behind. It was determined that Roma was doomed to crash. She was simply moving too fast, too low of an altitude, and her bag was too fragile. Her rudder snapped and she essentially folded in on herself. But there was more grievous factor to consider. The role that the inhalation gas played in creating the conflagration that needlessly took so many lives. Lieutenant Clarence Welch was asked the question that buzzed in so many ears. 
Would the death toll had been the same had a non-burning gas been used, like helium? Welch's answer was positively damning. I am sure the ship would not have burned so quickly, but what a great number of men could have been saved in an attempt made to save the others. On the afternoon of February 21st, 1922, the lives of 34 out of 45 men were claimed. Master Sergeant Harry Chapman and civilian engineer Charles Savorak were barely clinging to life because of their grievous injuries. Families began to filter into the area to claim the remains of their boys. Captain Kempner was always there to help. One father tried to insist to see inside his son's coffin. He couldn't believe that this was actually his child inside. He asked Kepner, my son had a scar on his pelvis. Did you see the scar? Kepner tried to deflect, assuring the father that this was indeed his son. When the desperate man went and relent, Kepner placed his hand on the lid and said, sir, your son's pelvis is missing. A memorial service was hosted in Newport News on February 24th, 1922. Two bodies, those of Captain Mabry and Private John Thompson, were used to represent the entire crew. Cars carried family members through the streets, as you see here. Guided by the Huntington Rifles and the tune of Saul's Death March, over a thousand people were lined the streets, huddled together, crying, staring and holding one another as if they were mourning the loss of their own brother, father, husband, fiance, son. At the casino grounds, grand speeches of large, of large memorials, promises to never let their names be forgotten were made. The ship's mascot dog, who I am pointing to right now, oh, sorry, uh, was on hand, standing by his commanding officer. Planes flew overhead with spray of roses laid down upon the casket. But none of the survivors were there. They were still barred from public comment. And neither was Stella Hoover. Virgil Hoffman was dead. The love of her life, the man she was set to marry in just four months' time, violently taken from her. She couldn't even bring herself to travel to Eden Rapids for his funeral. You see, children lost their fathers. Wives lost their husbands, and parents lost their sons. The world was forced to face the fact that we not only lost these heroic airmen, but we lost valued and loved people, and someone had to answer why. It was not only the public, but it was also Congress who were demanding answers as to what happened that day that cost so many lives. The debates included what to do about lighter than air aviation and the programs, and if they were to continue, would they keep using hydrogen? Chairman Madden of the House Appropriations Committee argued such ships accomplish nothing but to kill people. They are of no value to war. But Chairman Julius Kahn of the House Military Committee stated, to quote, the chances are that efforts will be made to prevent the reoccurrence of such a calamity. I feel, however, that so long as other nations of the world continue experiments regarding flights in the air, our country will have to keep up with the rest of the world. Congress ultimately made a compromise. The lighter than air programs would continue, but only if helium would be used. They reopened the helium procurement plant and Roma's legacy was to be the last American airship to ever fly with hydrogen. The survivors were left in various states of in the immediate aftermath of the wreck. Captain Reed steadily recovered and reported to the Naval Air Station in New Jersey to aid in the construction of the United States first American built rigid airship USS Shenandoah ZR-1. Alberto Flores and Joseph Biedenbach were moved to another air station, still working on the airships, but not, never again would either of them fly. Master Sergeant Harry Chapman and Charles Dvorak spent a year 
a piece recovering from their injuries. Chapman, who originally flew from, uh, was thrown from the ship unscathed, was left with scars all over his body and his organs from diving back into the fire to save three of his shipmates. Dvorak was left not only with physical scars, but with mental anguish. When he was well enough to return to Dayton, he was unable to resume his position due to what was described at the time as nervous spells, but what we would probably characterize today as PTSD. Stella Hoover brought herself to travel to Eaton Rapids around the time that she and Virgil were meant to get married that summer. His family welcomed her like she was one of their own. When going to her beloved's grave, she fell apart in violent tears. Later that day, she wrote to her mother saying that seeing his grave opened, quote, that deep, deep wound in my heart that has never healed. And this is in the middle, William Joseph Ryan, and I'm hoping my background doesn't um, make this too complicated, but what he is holding in his hand I have here, and that's his dress cover, which I was able to obtain from his family. The memory of those 45 men that were needlessly sacrificed, that needlessly sacrificed their lives in the line of duty was quickly buried alongside their bodies. They were just tossed aside, forgotten, and those promises made to give them these memorials and honors that they did deserve for just such a sacrifice were broken. Now to fast forward a little bit, in February 1925 in New York City, a beleaguered Clifford Tinker walked into a meeting before a select committee of the 68th Congress. He, he dedicated the year since Roma to laying blame on Congress for the deaths of those men including a January 1925 article in Collier's Weekly, which lambasted Congress. Mr. Stinker, or Mr. Tinker, sorry, <laughs> stood across from the represent from representatives Randolph Perkins, Frank R. Reed, and Annie S. Prawl, and Patrick B. O'Sullivan. Representative Perkins gestured to him by saying, Mr. Tinker, will you take the stand? With a nod of agreement, Representative Perkins swore in Mr. Tinker. The initial questions were obvious ones verifying his name, address, employment, his former status as a U.S. Navy public affairs officer. But the timber of the conversation took a dramatic turn. The Representative Reed turned to Mr. Tinker and said, I now ask the witness, Mr. Tinker, in regard to an article in Collier's Weekly on January 24th, 1925. He read the passage that directly implicated Cong Congress and killing Rama's men. It stated, Congress in the name of economy sold out those 34 lives for about $412 each. The training of the poor chaps alone cost the government an average of about $15,000 each. The officers and men and the Roma herself represented nearly $1 million. But what Clifford Tinker didn't know what is what was the truth. And it was a little bit more malicious. A transcript was read to Mr. Tinker from that closed session between Congress and Major Van Nostrand just prior to Roma's 1921 christening. All the public knew of this session was that Roma's engines were to be changed. But what was not revealed at that time was far worse. During that fiscal year, the Army had a budget surplus of around $1.3 million that was meant to be used for transportation of supplies for the U.S. Army. This would have well absorbed that $14,000 figure that Clifford Tinker had calculated in order to transport the helium from Fort Worth to Langley for Roma's final flight. In this meeting, Congress D.R. Anthony, Congressman D.R. Anthony Jr. explicitly asked Major Van Ostren about the supply of helium, to which he agreed that they had at least double on hand that was needed to inhalate Roma. Mr. Anthony said to Major Van Ostren, do you intend to use up the supply of helium and what of what you said you had on hand, or do you intend to keep it in storage? Major Van Ostrom replied, that will be a matter of policy to be decided, but my recommendation as a member of the board would be to conserve it for war purposes, except so far as it was necessary for scientific purposes. 
See, Congress leaned into the expertise of the of him regarding the airship. They were they are to be absolved of any blame. Sorry about that. In fact, their policies following the disaster show that they were actually horrified by what had happened and the recommendations that were made it, made to them prior to her flight. See, Major Van Nostrand was well aware of the dangers of hydrogen. He knew that Roma was a ship in fragile condition. He put pressure upon Roma's crew to get her in the air. He lied to Clifford Tinker, stating that there was no money to transport the supplies, though he was well aware that there was. Major Van Ostrom, for whatever reason, turned Roma into a tomb for 34 men and sentenced Master Sergeant Harry Chapman to a very slow and painful death. If there is anyone to blame for killing those men is the neglect of Major Van Ostrom. As, er as each year elapsed, the, so did the memory of those brave men. Master Sergeant Harry Chapman was the only one of the crew to receive any sort of commendation for his bravery that cold day. He was the first recipient of the now defunct Cheney Award. He passed away in 1940 after suffering from lung cancer as a direct result of the long-term damage he sustained saving his crewmates. See, these men were heroes. These men did their duty, and yet we washed our hands of them as if their sacrifice meant nothing. Up until recently, there wasn't even any real public memorials for these men. And it was just this past February that after much advocacy and time, a historical highway marker was erected in Norfolk, and we hope to dedicate it sometime soon. Now, with the exception of Master Sergeant Chapman, these men were never given any sort of commendation for their sacrifices. Their stories are those deserving of awards, honors, buildings named for them, and other types of memorials, and yet they have been forgotten as if they mattered to no one. If, these were to happen, if this were to happen today, no one would hesitate to grant some sort of commendation upon them posthumously. We would rally around the families, demand answers and accountability. We would do what we could to never forget them. Why should the 45 men that flew on Roma nearly a century ago be any different? There are still loved ones who grieve for them in quiet corners of cemeteries where these men are buried. The men of Roma deserve better from us and it is our responsibility to make sure that they are given what they deserve and that their voices are never silenced again, and that they will never be forgotten. Now to wrap things up, um, if you would like more information about Roma, about any of my other books, you can visit my website. My new book actually has a chapter dedicated to the hydrogen processing plant um, of Roma, and uh, you can pick that up from my website. Um, I believe once the Mariner's Museum reopens, I believe they have copies in their gift shop. Um, and thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Actually, Nancy, this, was, this was fabulous, but our time has run short. Oh. Um, everyone loved it. it. It was fascinating, and the, the footage was incredible. So thank you. We, we encourage everyone to watch it, if you didn't get to see it all, on our YouTube channel. Uh, mm -hmm. That'll post soon. And since we are out of time, Nancy, I'm going to ask that people email me and Jenna has put my email address up for any questions and then you and I can get the answers and we'll get back to our viewers. How about that? That would be fabulous. And as a last note, this is a piece of Roma ah. um, that it came from her um, rudder. And I forgot to share that during the presentation. I apologize. <laughs> no, no. Well, it, it was incredibly very interesting and everyone stayed with you till the end. But with our time now, it's it, we've got to... Um, wrap it up here but thank you again for for thank you for sharing this story and thank all of you for viewing this afternoon